Welcome to the panel that started 10 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, I'm Bob Thomas. I'm a professor next door at Loyola, and uh, we're in the Center for Environmental Communication. And um, uh, this, uh, this panel has a lot of interest to me because I think we were just talking outside about sometimes being very naive about when news breaks, about misunderstanding legal components of laws and things like that. But, uh, you know, I've always been a big proponent of, uh, of freeing ourselves up from uh, dependence on imported oil. And uh, so I have found myself vacillating uh, on different proposals that are made because it looks like it might lead to something that I've always believed in. And then every time we do that, it turns around to be, no, this is not for independence. This is really so that international corporations can export energy. And uh, it's kind of deflating. Uh, to be in that position, but a lot, I see a lot of people in the room nodding their heads that have been fighting this battle for their, their careers as well. But uh, So we're going to explore that today, and uh, we have a, a really good panel here today. Uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, uh, Professor Eric Smith, my buddy that we did a lot of work after the, the BP uh, blowout, talking to the public about what some of the ramifications might be. <coughs> Eric will be our lead speaker, and he's here, he's a uh, professor here at Tulane, and then he's going to be followed by Robert Weigel, managing partner of Walser, Weigel, and Garside, uh, based in Ocean Springs. And I think many of you know Robert, he's been uh, on the environmental scene here for a very long time. And then the third speaker is sitting in the back there, uh, Jerome Ringo, who many of you know. Uh, because Jerome has been very involved in environmental movements in this state for a very long time. So I think we're, we're, we're the stage is set for us to have a good discussion to look at this issue of independence uh, versus export. So, Eric, please. All right, well, as, uh, I'm with the Tulane Energy. Thank you. I'm with the Tulane Energy Institute. We spend a, a lot of time looking at energy issues, uh, including renewables. Uh, I have to say I tend to focus on the traditional fuels and tr traditional power generation. But what we're talking about today is exports and the pros and cons associated with them. And uh, we've got a lot of slides. So I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. But uh, we're not just going to talk about coal. We're going to talk about oil and gas exports. Uh, LNG as part of the gas picture, and some of the unintended consequences from, from limiting certain exports. So uh, with that, I, I, uh, I'll get started, and uh, you all can stop me at any time. I'm not uh, proud about interruptions. So how big is the export business for Louisiana? It's quite, quite big indeed. Uh, here's the national total, <clears throat> $1.62 trillion. We're about 65 billion of that, and of that 65 billion, almost half is associated with oil and gas and energy uh, and coal. We're number six in the nation, uh, and uh, we export to places like China, Mexico, Canada, the Netherlands, Japan, Colombia, France, Brazil, Egypt, and Panama, plus a host of smaller places. Um, and that's before we've reopened the, the Panama Canal for the wider ships, which will allow things like exports of LNG to, to Asia. Uh, when we talk about hydrocarbon in exports, we're talking about products, transfer, or transportation modes, and we have a few specific examples we'll talk about. Uh, plus, you'll hear a lot about RAN before we're finished, uh, another uh, coal facility. And we use all of these every day. Uh, the, the point people tend to forget is when somebody says, well, we're going to make this one change. There's never one change, because if I change the mix of products, I have to change the mix of transportation modes, and I probably end up having to build a new terminal or tear down an old terminal or do something to facilitate the, the transportation. Uh, best example of that right now is we haven't built Keystone XL and we are building some other pipelines that were basically pipelines short. And as a result, we're using trains perhaps more than we should. Tra nothing wrong with trains, but when you go from 4,000 cars a year to 400,000 cars a year, it, you, you get the impression that the accident rate has gone up. The accident rate may be the same. It's just we've got more volume moving, moving over the rails. Uh, 
So coal terminals, we have a bunch of them. The one in red is us. Um, here's the sort of uh, exports of coal that you, you uh, come to expect. First thing is there are two markets in coal. There's metallurgical coal, which goes into producing steel, and then there's steam coal, typically a lower grade of coal. It sells at a much lower price and is used for generating electricity. Uh, and you can see the rough mix on where our coal exports are going. Uh, the metallurgical coal tends to go to Europe primarily, as does the, the steam coal. A little, little dirty secret, the coal that they're burning in Germany today that's sort of degrading their air pollution standards is coming out of the United States. Uh, here's where our coal goes. <coughs> you see Europe is the, uh, the big hitter in there, and uh, Asia probably number two. And here's an interesting matrix of the Louisiana coal shipments. We're looking at about 15 million tons <coughs> of steam coal and about 6.5 million tons of metallurgical coal. So although we are number two and 20% of the total, we're only about 9% of the metallurgical or the higher price coal exports, and we're about 40% of the lower grade steam coal exports. So the red lines here, I won't, I won't go through reading slides, but uh, metallurgical coal represents less than 8% of production, but over 56% of total coal exports in 2013. So people like our metallurgical coal. And the Gulf Coast is responsible for about 30% of the total shipments of coal. So that's what a coal terminal looks like. This, some might say this is a little sanitized because I'm not showing the, uh, the shore piles of coal, but uh, <laughs> the point is that the coal can, can uh, come down the river by barge. Um, very little of our coal actually moves by rail because we don't have adequate rail service down that far. This is near Port Sulphur, Louisiana. Uh, we also have oil terminals, and this is uh, one of the larger ones around. This is St. James. And what you see there are barges, ships, and in the background, a huge tank farm. A tank farm's connected by pipeline to virtually the whole U.S., and we move a lot of crude around by pipeline, which is easily the safest and most cost-efficient way to do it. But we also bring it in by barge, and we have two-way movement. So, for example, in East New Orleans, which I'll show you in a minute, or in a couple of minutes, uh, this just shows the distribution. This is an EIA chart, and it shows crude oil production in 2013 versus imports. And you see that roughly in balance, uh, we will expect in 2014 to see higher domestic production and lower imports. This is where it's coming from. Over 80% of it comes from three plays. Uh, the Eagleford over in Texas, the Bakken in North Dakota, and the Permian Basin, which is sort of on the border between New Mexico and West Texas. Not all crude's the same, and in the case of the shale oils, uh, you're talking about a much lighter uh, fraction, and the, these are just charts to display the Bakken and the Eagleford. And the reason this is important is because our refineries are designed to run particular types of crude. So you can produce all the light sweet crude out of the Bakken you want, you can only process a certain amount of it in the United States, which gives rise to the argument for why we want to export light sweet crude. Uh, the reason is because we need to still import the same amount of heavy sour crude we always have used, or we have to shut the refineries back, and that's not a, a good idea. Uh, anybody has uh, These charts will be available later if anybody has any questions. They're certainly free to ask them. Speaking of the refineries, uh, we have refineries in two categories. We call them simple refineries, which are ten, <coughs> generally designed to only run on light sweet crude. And then we have the complex refineries, which are the ones like the ones around here, which can run anything, but only in certain proportions. And uh, the reason is because they have something called a delayed coker, which takes the real bottom of the barrel stuff, extracts a little more diesel fuel from it and other distillates and produces a, essentially a synthetic coal, which gets us back to our coal export facilities. What do we do with all of that petroleum coke? We export it. We use a little bit domestically, but that 
that last little bit of hydrocarbon that comes out of the refinery goes downriver to places like Port Sulphur, and it's ultimately exported around the world for uses of, of fuel and things like cement kilns. Here's our annual coke exports, uh, as well as the uh, <coughs> petroleum coke, as, excuse me, U.S. exports and Pad 3. Uh, this is Petroleum Administrative Defense District 3, which is kind of us, the Gulf Coast, Oklahoma, and, and New Mexico, uh, where the bulk of the refining in the United States is located. We keep increasing capacity, but we don't increase the number of refineries. Actually, the numbers shrink because we keep shutting down small refineries and expanding uh, refineries like Marathon upriver here. And we've almost doubled its capacity. They have another expansion ready to go. Uh, so our refineries are getting bigger but fewer over time. So here's the, the chart I was talking about. The light sweet crudes there you see are the sort of the green and the light blue. Uh, the dark blue and the gray are the heavier grades. And as you see, the heaviest grade hasn't changed a bit. All of the efforts at, at uh, displacing crude from the United States import slate are based on light sweet displacement. And we get into arguments about with the, the Saudis. We haven't really been exporting a lot of crude so far, but we have been displacing imports, which has the same practical effect on the Saudis. We've done about 5 million barrels a day that didn't exist uh, you know, five years ago. Uh, the good news is our imports are coming down, Bob. So <laughs> we're in good shape there. Uh, you see the producers here. Canada is our, our single largest supplier. The Saudis are holding their own or shrinking a little bit. Mexico's taken a hit, not because we don't like Mexican crude, which is heavy and sour, problem is the Mexicans can't produce enough of it. So, and then the rest of the world is, is taking the hit, primarily places like Nigeria and the other West African countries that produce light sweet crude. But it's been coming down. And this just displays the same information. Just look at 2013. What you're looking at is the Houston, the Port Arthur, and the New Orleans refineries by a group. And the light colors are the light sweet crudes they used to import and you see how much they're importing in 2013, and it's shrunk even since then. So for all intents and purposes, we are out of the business of importing light sweet crude. Uh, <clears throat> we've got this little problem right now with price. One of the results is people firmly believe the prices will go back up. Big question is when. And Cushing is our main inventory location in the United States for crude oil. It's where we price West Texas intermediate crude for the rest of the country. And this is just a plot showing that uh, come May, June of this year, we're going to be out of capacity for storage. At that point, we either have to have relaxation on exports or we have to shut in wells. That may be a good idea for some people here, but <laughs> for us in the oil industry, it's a really bad idea. Where does the, our heavy sour crude come from? Uh, Mexico is a, a major source. The other source is Venezuela, and nobody's going to cry a lot of tears about Venezuela and losing a, losing a market. Bearing in mind that Venezuela, just here in Louisiana, owns the Sitco refinery, and they own half of Exxon down here at Chalmette. And those are going to be very hard to uh, dislodge imports. Um, how does it get to the refineries? Just about every way we, we can think about. Tankers. Um, barges, pipelines, and uh, ultimately even trucks and, and rail. So. so what about rail? Well, here's a typical unit train. Starts out up in the Dakotas. There's four engines, 115 tank cars, a couple of very big transfer terminals to, to load and unload, and it's basically an express train. It runs at about 45 miles an hour, and it goes from point to point. Um, <clears throat> You've got to spend some money on rail upgrades, but you're looking at 70,000 barrels a trip, which if you want to put that in context, four of those trains would equal a fairly small tanker. Uh, and it takes about 72 hours for a one-way trip, about an, a day to unload and a day to load. And it's been increasing. Now, this is the 6% that's not moving by pipeline, <clears throat> but what you see are the barge, 
in this light brown, the domestic crude receipts by truck, primarily to smaller refineries, another couple of percent, and then rails on top of that. So in the larger context, rail's not a big deal, but rail, like most small things, has been growing very rapidly. And I think it was the Wall Street Journal recently pointed out that uh, President Obama can take credit for that fact, in part by the delays on trying to get some of the safer, more cost-efficient pipelines put in play. Uh, here's our terminal system for, uh, for rail movements along with the, <coughs> the railroads. We classify our railroads. Uh, the New Orleans area is one of the few areas in the country along with Chicago that has all six class one railroads. All of the biggest railroads have terminals here, here in the New Orleans area. Gulf Gateway is in East New Orleans. That's uh, one that I'm most familiar with. It's, it's uh, <clears throat> down where we used to send the rail cars to Mexico out in East New Orleans. That's the site. They have a uh, what they call a ladder terminal. They bring in those big trains and split them into like four pieces and then they unload them all at the same time. And they either go in the tankage or they go into barges and the barges deliver the crude to the refineries. Um, there are others, Plains All-Americans, part of the St. James Terminal we looked at earlier. We've got New Star. IMTT just sold their, uh, the other half of their business, Tommy Coleman, uh, cleared a billion dollars on that deal. So, <laughs> um, so that's not locally controlled anymore, but at one time, Maytex was one of the larger terminal owners in the world. Uh, Baton Rouge has the Sunshine Terminal, Cross Texas up at Riverside, and there are a couple of new crude facilities. These are all rail to barge type facilities. These are the sort of the uh, the receiving end of those rail transfer systems that we have in place. This is what one looks like, and this is not so far away. This is uh, if I walked a mile towards the river, I would cross those tracks. Uh, so it's moving across the back of uh, Audubon, the zoo, and it's between the zoo and the river in the butterfly, for those of you who are local. And that's what the terminal looks like as yes, it's uh, full up with tank cars being unloaded. You see the tank farm, and then you see the barges off in the, the canal. We've got a lot of pipelines in the United States. Uh, as you well know, we'd like to build a couple more. Uh, Keystone XL is specifically focused on moving that heavy sour crude from the western Canadian areas, the so-called tar sands oil, and moving it all the way down to the coast where we have these comp complex refineries that can process it. That's what the whole argument is. Um, IHS just released a study making the point counter to the president's position that says that virtually all of that crude will be refined in the United States. It will displace other crudes that were coming in, but the only way you're going to get less raw uh, heavy sour crude being imported in the United States is by bringing it in from Canada. Big gap here. If you notice the East Coast, not a whole lot of pipelines, right? Yet we have a lot of people that live on the East Coast, on the Atlantic seaboard. One of the big arguments for rail movement has been to get light sweet crude to these refineries in Delaware Bay and in New York Harbor. Uh, that can't run the heavy sour crudes to get it to them, and the only way to do that is by rail right now. There, there are efforts to move ships up from the Gulf Coast here to deliver light sweet crude out of places like Corpus Christi to New York, and there's some of that going on, but uh, the bulk of it's coming in by rail. Here's the, the split on domestic crude refinery receipts. And the, in addition to noticing the growth since 2008, notice that the top part, which is all of the uh, sort of small movement systems, have been growing pretty rapidly. And the yellow there is the, the, uh, the tank cars. The, interestingly, the barges are much larger than the tank cars are right now, and the coastal tankers as well. Here's the same picture for, let's see, this was... This is just a proportional uh, version of the same data. You see a decline in pipeline receipts. And here's the same thing for foreign crude, um, kind of the reverse of the mirror uh, or mirror image. 
you see the pipelines are relatively the smaller share and the, not surprisingly the tankers are the larger share and there the, the percentage is going the other way. So we still are moving crude into the U.S. Um, primarily by rail out of Canada and that's what you're seeing here. We also move some in by ship from Mexico. What's our tanker fleet look like? Uh, we have 55 tankers in the fleet, not very many. Uh, 42 are not in, in on the west coast. The 13 that are on the west coast are designed to move crude down from Valdez. We've got some new ones being built. We've got Kinder Morgan, known as you know more of a pipeline and terminal operation onshore. They've gone into the tanker business in a big way, bought two tanker companies, and are building additional tankers. And then we've got Shell and Petrobras operating shuttle tankers in the Gulf, simply bringing crude in from the, the floating production systems into the beach and going back to get some more. Um, the other dynamic going on with tankers is the Florida product tankers are being replaced by ATBs and ITBs, thank you, and put in service as crude tankers. So we're, we're going away from using tankers to deliver gasoline and diesel and going towards using these large ocean-going tugboats to do the same thing. So the opportunities going forward are we can add some product capability to Loop, which is primarily designed to import crude oil. We can expand the colonial and plantation pipeline systems, which are finished goods pipeline systems delivering uh, gasoline and diesel to the, to the Atlantic seaboard. Um, we could restart St. Croix. St. Croix was built to deliver gasoline and diesel to the, the New York Harbor area. It's been shut down since 2012. I mentioned the ATBs. We could restart Avondale here locally. That would uh, warm a lot of people's hearts. Um, I'm not giving that one a really high choice. Or we could update the Jones Act to allow some foreign-built vessels to operate under the U.S. flag on these specific routes to make sure New York gets its gasoline. Um, we're still having problems getting crude out of North Dakota. Most, something like 70% of the crude coming out of North Dakota is coming by rail, which is a much higher percentage than anywhere else on the, on the uh, continent. And you can see we're trying to make some progress by building additional pipelines, but we're going to still be far behind. And essentially the rail capacity is going to have to carry the load. That's one of the new pipelines. The, the Bakken Three Forks is the producing area. Potoka is the receiving point from where you can distribute crude around the Midwest. Uh, we can export refined products all day long. Uh, we, in 81, President Reagan spearheaded an effort to get the 1975 restrictions removed. Unfortunately, he didn't remove the restrictions on crude because we didn't have any surplus crude at the time. Uh, but he did get the, the restrictions on gasoline and diesel and uh, few other fuel removed. These are just pictures of those two pipelines. Uh, Colonial starts out with 2 million plus barrels a day in Houston. And it feeds the whole coast when it gets to uh, Linden, New Jersey. It's about 600,000 barrels. So with that, uh, I'll just make the point we're now a net exporter of refined products. So any questions? Otherwise, we'll, we'll turn it over to uh, hear about a particular terminal. Thank you, Eric. All right. So let's wait for the I'll take him down. Thank you, Jennifer. Just get that one ready. There you go. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Robert Weigel. Can everybody hear me okay if I get away from the microphone? Great, thank you. Um, so I've uh, had the good fortune to work for a lot of citizens and conservation groups over the years. Um, over the last say six or eight years uh, working on issues involving coal-fired power plants, coal mining, export terminals. I've had the chance to do a lot of research, a lot of litigation. I've done a lot of, uh, of soul searching and I've come to the conclusion that uh, coal makes good economic sense. For me, 
in particular. Because if you're a plaintiff's lawyer in the environmental field, you can make a lot of money <laughs> off the detritus and waste that co coal has caused in this country. I'm being a little bit facetious with you about that, but just give you a few examples, right? Um, over in Mississippi, where I live, coal tailings sitting in the marsh, waiting for a disaster to happen. Out in Nevada, where I'm working with the Moapa Paiute tribe right now, one of the most polluted sites out there in the Las Vegas area is right next to their reservation and has been there for years. Everywhere that coal goes, it leaves a footprint behind it. Now, something that really struck me in Eric's presentation that I think it's important to remember when he talked about exports in particular, um, coal is a commodity, right? And commodities go up and down in price. They go up and down in price often violently, you know, they look like my year-to-year -year income, right? Sometimes it's here and sometimes it's way down here. So when you talk about basing a part of your coastal economy on a commodity, that's something that you have to recognize and you have to take into account. It's, uh, you know, the other thing that I, I think really struck me is that you saw in one of the slides that Eric had up, the graph of coal exports goes like this until roughly 2012 in there somewhere and then it starts to go down like this because of declining demand in places like China for example which is uh, finally making an effort to clean up its air and deal with some of the really drastic air pollution problems that they have now. So you see that declining export market that's happening right now. Here domestically, those of you who were in the seminar before this one on 111D and the Clean Air Act, you know, if that sticks around, you're really talking about, you know, at some point the end of coal as a domestic power source here. And even if it doesn't happen, the fact is that building coal-fired power plants in this country has become economically prohibitively expensive. I mean, what you see around the country, one of the plants that's being built now over here in Mississippi is going to cost $6.2 billion when it's finished with. $6.2 billion, most expensive power plant essentially ever built on a megawatt hour basis in the country. Coal isn't making economic sense here anymore. Where in Mississippi? Kemper County, Mississippi being built by the Southern Company. That's right. When it started out, they said it was going to cost $2.4 billion, but it, it didn't work out that way for them. Right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about exports and how this works You know, on the hoof, if you would, out in the field, right? Anytime you think about some product going from one place to the other, it's got to start out somewhere. It's got to be produced, and it's got to get from here to wherever it's going. And then once it gets there, it's got to be used for something. I want to talk about the middle step in that process because that's one of the things that I've been working on lately. And that's what we call an export terminal. Now, the one that I got to work on, and I think I have at least one of my clients here in the room, the folks of the Gulf Restoration Network. Um, this is down in Plaquemines Parish. If you look up here, you can see... It's not a great graphic, but uh, you can see New Orleans up here in the river bend. We're right there, almost covered up by the little area map part. And then the site is down the river there in Plaquemines Parish. It's called the Ram Terminal. And the concept here was that they're going to build, this is a drawing of the thing, you're going to have coal piles, you're going to have barge fleeting out here on the river, you're going to bring coal in, you're going to bring it in by rail, you're going to bring it down the river on barges, and it goes out from there. And let's see what they say about it. That's right, it's a 600-acre site, and they were talking about handling 6 million tons of coal per year through that site. So a lot of coal flowing through that site. Now, this is, uh, this is one of the other ones that's right down there in Plaquemines Parish. The United Bulk Terminal. This is sort of what you know the thing looks like on the ground. You have these great, great big 
piles of coal out there, which uh, are not covered up. And by the way, there, there have been lawsuits down there in Plaquemines Parish about what happens when the wind blows and the coal dust comes off of those piles. But this happens everywhere that coal is piled up in bulk, whether it's at a power plant or a bulk terminal. You get migration off-site into people's houses and all of that. Now, what also happens when you... Uh, when you have these things, there's, there's a little bit of leakage. I'm sorry this is not as good a picture as I would like, but you can see the dark cloud there on the river, the little dark part. And where's one of my GR invites? You fly over these things, right? Do you, do you ever observe that phenomenon? All the time, every time. This is, this is kind of amazing, right? Because we have a Clean Water Act, right, that's supposed to say that you know, that kind of thing is not supposed to be happening, and yet it's happening on a regular basis at these terminals all the time. Um, the other thing that you get is the gunk, the fall back into the river, and around these terminals, anybody that's been out there around them much is going to tell you, you find the sludge and you find coal and all of that that's in the river. So you have, you know, the economists call it... Um, externalities, which is a, a nice word that I like, right? And it means, you know, something that, uh, something that you do that gets pushed off onto somebody else. Now, this ram site is uh, right around this community called Ironton, and it, this is the one thing that's kind of interesting about this. When uh, the application for this terminal was put in, it described this whole area as a heavily industrialized area that's just waiting for something like this to happen. And while you do have industrial facilities that are near it, as you can see, this area here in particular, and the folks in, in Ironton who actually lived there and lived around there, I think, might quibble with the idea that this was a heavily industrialized area just waiting to be more heavily industrialized. Now, let's go, let's talk about a little bit of legal background here. Oh, by the way, one other point about this thing. Um, you can see the same little bend in the river there. You got the proposed site. And then, one of the biggest sediment diversions meant to rebuild the coastal marsh is going to be right absolutely next to this thing there on the river. So let's talk a little bit about legal background. So somebody like Bram Terminal folks come down here and they say, we want to build this project. We think it's going to be good for you. Louisiana's constitution, a little bit unusual, has a provision that broadly speaking people call a public trust provision, which means that essentially and somebody comes and says, I want to do something that's going to use public resources, the state, the agencies, whoever is looking at it, is supposed to look at that and say, well, is this really good? Is this a good trade-off? Is this a good thing for the people of the state? When you take into account all the pluses, and when you take into account all the minuses that could go along with that, it's a balancing process. And... So that, in Louisiana, it's constitutional, but that's been implemented through a bunch of statutes and regulations that have specific things in there that say, you know, if you're going to issue a coastal use permit, for example, for this, this thing here, look at whether there are alternative sites. Look at what the impact on coastal resources itself is going to be and decide if that's good. Now, how does that really work in practice? Because what you have here, right, this Eric slide show, what you have is a, you know, a pretty complicated situation with a global commodity, right? It's dependent on supply, dependent on demand, and it's dependent on transportation modes as well. And so you would think that we would be looking at things, you know, like what does that market look like? How likely is this thing to succeed? Are there other alternative sites? How, you know, how rosy are your financial projections and things like that? But as a practical matter, what you have is a straight state agency that is often strapped for resources. 
and you have an entity that's out there in the private market that, for reasons of its own, wants to fill this thing. And is the state agency always capable of really looking at that project and making a detailed analysis of it? So you really, when you get into projects like this in the permitting process, you almost enter an alternative universe, in a way, where the applicant comes in and they have you know, what really is, is a lovely, rosy picture. I read a lot of these things, and they always sound really good to me. <laughs> I start digging into them a little bit, because you find you know, that there are only low-value wetlands on the site. There are going to be no off-site impacts. We're going to create 300 jobs that are going to go on for so many years. Nothing is going to happen to anybody. It's a heavily industrialized site anyway, and doesn't matter to anyone. Now, so, how'd that work out here? That's what the RAM folks said. And let's just let's take one example, because this is the, an example that turned out to be important in this one. They said, well, we looked at alternative sites, but none of them worked. And I don't mean they said that uh, as the conclusion to a siting study. I mean, that's what they said, right? That was it. We looked at alternative sites, but none of them worked for us. And so what did our Department of Natural Resources say about that? They said, okay, all right, we can live with that. So they went ahead and approved the permitting for this thing. Now, what about the potential for pollution? What about the potential impacts on the diversion project? The DNR said, well, other agencies are going to take care of that. Now, fortunately, the folks in Ironton some of my other colleagues here thought this was worth taking into court in Plaquemines Parish to see what a judge would think about that. And ultimately, fortunately, what the judge said was three different things. He said, one, what alternative sites are you talking about, right? Where is it? If, you know, as Gertrude Stein famously said, there's no there there, then how are we supposed to evaluate this? And he also said, what else are you going to bring into this thing besides coal? And he said, what's the effect that you're going to have on this diversion here? And I'll tell you all, this was, uh, even though I, I think this decision, particularly for something that has as complicated a supply, demand, <coughs> economic external impacts picture as a coal terminal. This decision was a bad one, but you know, at the same time, uh, judges, judges very, very, very seldom overturn agency decisions. They're extremely reluctant to do it. Um, they're typically very solicitous of the other branches of government. And you know, many of you have probably heard somebody, some talking head, talking about activist liberal judges, right, around the country. And I'm just, I'm here to tell you there, there are no activist liberal judges. I mean, well, actually, there is one. <laughs> there is one, I know. And uh, if you find any, I want you to tell me because I want to go file some lawsuits with them. But they're really not out there. Judges are just conservative about doing things like this. And the fact that a judge was willing to throw out the permit for this project, you know, really means that you had a very, very poorly developed record for a project that, you know, to say this is a good thing for the people down there in Plaquemines Parish, it's a good thing for the communities that are going to have coal trains running through them. To say that's a good thing for those folks, you'd really want to have more than what you had here. Now, here's, here's sort of a postscript to this that uh, you know, I think is really interesting as well. Yeah, ordinarily, when we get into court on something like this, a, a permit, say, whoever the proponent of the project is, in this case, the, the RAM folks, they're ordinarily going to be in there with their own lawyer. They're going to get into the case. They're going to try to help defend the permit. They're going to try to help supply whatever lack there is there. They never showed up. I don't even know what anybody that works for that company looks like, right? They never showed up anywhere. And as far as I know, they haven't showed up anywhere since we got that decision on the permit. 
So you really have to wonder whether, given the decline in exports that we're seeing now, this was just something that somebody thought might be a good idea and ran through the process as long as they didn't have to do too darn much to justify it. I mean, it's really been a little bit surprising that we have seen no involvement from the proponents of this project so far, which is not to say that they're not in Baton Rouge right now, you know, lobbying to try to get something done about this, but we really, we haven't seen any evidence of it so far. So, here's the conclusions that I would, uh, I would draw from all of that, that uh, export terminals... are something that needs to be looked at with somewhat of a jaundiced eye because, again, let's think about somebody's mining coal up here and somebody is transporting it down to this point and somebody's shipping it off for somebody to do something else with. And what about the folks who live in Ironton? I mean, this is a project that right, had really a very minimal level of analysis even given what we know about the external impacts of these kinds of facilities um, is claimed that there are going to be 300 jobs associated with it, but yet when the going got tough here, the entity that was supporting it really has not shown up to say anything about it at all. And I, that tells me that the level of scrutiny that this kind of project ought to be getting is considerably more substantial than what this one got, at least. And if we're willing... If we really want to do this kind of thing here, we have to really keep in mind, this is a commodity. Commodities are not always a stable basis for an economy. And, you know, the Pied Piper effect might tell you you would chase the jobs, but I think it's something that, that bears a lot of scrutiny. How am I doing in time, Jennifer? Yeah, like four minutes. I've got four minutes. Does anybody have any questions if I have four minutes? I'll let Jerome get up here and tell us some. Jerome actually has a much more interesting story to tell than I do. We should have time for quick. All right. Thank you very, very much. And uh, Mark... It's wonderful to be here at Tulane and get a chance to see a lot of old faces and old friends and those of us that have been on the battlefield for so long. I'm Jerome Ringo and uh, my perspective is somewhat a little different. Uh, I, I'm, I don't have any slides to show you. Uh, I'm basically going to share with you some of the uh, realities uh, of, uh, of 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 uh, they've talked about the increase in exports of coal and petrochemical products, and unfortunately, on, on the other end of that, which of course many in this country look at the value of those exports as being more jobs and strengthen strengthening of our economy, but uh, on the other end of that. Uh, equation or uh, consequences that uh, oftentimes uh, extend beyond our own borders domestically. Uh, I'm the former chairman of the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, most, a lot of you all know us by Ranger Rick, those of us that are old enough to be raised on Ranger Rick. Uh, and also um, was the president of a coalition on clean energy that uh, we built, and I say we, I had a great team that we built, uh, started in 2003 and in 2010, had built a membership up to 19 million members to become the largest coalition on clean energy in the world to promote the research and development of renewable energy technologies as an alternative to fossil fuels. I could have uh, been on one of the other panels today. I saw that there was a panel on climate, or will be a panel on climate, and I was part of the U.S. delegation at Kyoto, uh, and also part of the U.S. delegation in Copenhagen, uh, and and was the uh, NGO uh, spokesperson at the climate talks in Montreal. So I have a real interest in uh, the increased export of uh, coal, 
I have a real interest in on the other end where it is going and what impact it's unfortunately having on the lives of those people who are so hungry for energy and electricity. I have recently been spending lots of time in Africa uh, as my current company, Agrico, of which I'm the CEO and president, are developing renewable energy technologies as alternatives to coal and coal-fired power plants, uh, primarily in West and East Africa. I'm doing lots of work in Ghana right now, in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, we are now going into Benin, Niger, Togo, uh, possibly Nigeria. I'm having some apprehensions about that, but that's uh, another thing. I've had mixed emotions about, over the years, of our, as I've watched this country attempt to reduce its dependency on foreign oil. Uh, we have uh, decided that it was important that we wean ourselves from Saudi Arabian oil and oil and gas from other countries and the many of us in the political or many people in the political arena felt that the answer to weaning ourselves from foreign oil was to focus here on America and drill baby drill. And some have felt that that was the answer. Um, and and uh, so over the years I have seen this country uh, become, uh, no longer be the junkie, but now turn into the dealer. To where we are now exporting what we consider to be energy. And when you stand on the shores of Ghana and Togo and Côte d'Ivoire, you see the shiploads of coal coming in. I don't see shiploads of energy. I see shiploads of pollution. And these are people that are already exploited by virtue of the fact that the developing countries of the world suffer the greatest impact from climate. They already suffer the challenges of blackouts on a daily basis because they simply don't have electricity because of the drought conditions in the African nations, the reservoirs at the dams are very low, so therefore I spend six to eight hours a day in Accra, Ghana, in the dark. And imagine what the poorest people in Ghana must be going through. But right now, I met several weeks ago with President Mahama in Accra, and the Ghanaian people want energy any way they can get it. They don't care whether it's coal, they don't care whether it's hydro, they don't care. Just bring us the energy. We're tired of being in the dark. There was a protest of about 5,000 people last week on the presidential palace basically saying to President Mohammed in Ghana, if you don't fix this energy problem, you will not be reelected in the 2016 election. President Mohammed gave me a call and said, please bring your energy units into Ghana now. Not because he wanted so much clean energy, he just needs the energy. And there is a proposal in Ghana for a 600 megawatt coal-fired power plant to be built by the Chinese. And of course, as was forementioned, of course, China is taking steps to reduce their uh, pollution outputs in their country, but uh, like so many other countries, are simply sending their uh, pollutants to other countries. And that's unfortunate. I've oftentimes said that if we in this country were using the idea that reducing our dependency on foreign oil would reduce our CO2 discharges to the atmosphere, uh, that's not the case. If we're going to reduce our dependency on foreign oil and drill baby drill in America, I use the analogy of switching seats on the Titanic. The ship's still going down. And so maybe I should have been in a climate discussion. But I'm really concerned that in places like Ghana, in third world countries, but we don't have to go to third world countries, we can go along the shores of the Mississippi River within a stone's throw of Tulane University and see that as they build larger coal terminals, that there are going to be people that are going to be adversely impacted as if they aren't already adversely impacted 
from living in the cancer corridor. And these, unfortunately, more times than not, are the poorest. Those people that suffer that disproportionate impact of living in close proximity to the petrochemical refineries, the bulk plants, the coal, the coal shippers, and what have you. And now we increase our exports and increase our need for terminals and increase the amount of impact that we're putting on the lives of those people that suffer the greatest. How do we fix it? So what I'm doing in Ghana, as I'm doing in many corners of the world right now, I'm the president of a company called Agrico, and we are developing in, uh, renewable energy technologies, mainly around hydro, to boost the hydro generation uh, at the dams without having to build new dams, without having to displace people, without having to build new or add to the grid. We now have a unit called an in-stream auger turbine. It looks like a pontoon boat with giant screws on the bottom of it that we can drop in a river. The river current turns the screws and it generates electricity. And we have now developed a 45-foot unit that can generate about 550 kilowatts of electricity in nine miles per hour of water. We can drop it on a river near a remote village, run a power line from the unit, and light up that village. We don't have to build a dam, and we don't have to build new power lines, and we don't have to displace people, and we don't need fuel. And I think these are the alternatives that have to be presented to developing nations so that they don't live with the belief that we must satisfy our gluttonous appetite for energy by any means necessary. Because there are other means. And so we have just are in the process of finalizing a power purchase agreement with the uh, Volta River Authority and the Ghanaian government to generate uh, 100 megawatts of electricity at the Okasambu Dam. And we're going to put the units downstream of the outflow of the dam and pick up additional electricity and tie it directly into the grid and hopefully reduce the amount of uh, regional blackouts that we're seeing in Ghana. Uh, needless to say, the Chinese are not too happy with me right now with our proposal to build a 600 megawatt coal fired power plant. How much is that power plant that they're coal fired power plant they were talking about? What are they talking about? Well, they say at 2 billion, but you can imagine that that number is going to increase. Uh, it, it's, it's uh, and to be very honest with you, they're going to do 600 megs. And they're saying two billion. That's the word we've been getting. And our units, we can do 600 megs for about 300 million. So <laughs> that 600 megawatt plan will take 10 years to build. We can do 600 meg in probably 28 months manufactured ship in a river operating. So, uh, there are alternatives out there. I know we got a fight on our hands with the Chinese and many of the companies that are planning on burning coal in, in, in West Africa or importing coal. we got a fight on our hands, but this is about justice and this is about improving the quality of life of people that are already oppressed and about doing what's right. And that's what where my heart is, and that's where the heart is of the, uh, the employees in my company. I've, I've put together a great team. Um, I've got the support of, of a, a lot of uh, individuals in the United States in the banking industry, in the finance industry, that sees the value of simply helping people improve their quality of life. <clears throat> So that's what I'm doing now, um, and, and I live in Louisiana. I, I've, I've been fighting a battle here for many years, and many of you have been fighting a battle a lot longer than I uh, in Louisiana and the challenges that we face along the Gulf Coast. And We know that the economic impact of the oil and gas industry has been huge. Uh, I live in Lake Charles, and there's already a proposal for a potential $80 billion expansion 
that is going to stimulate the economy of Southwest Louisiana like we've never seen before. But nobody wants to talk about the price. Nobody wants to talk about that. Everybody's talking about the jobs, and that's great, and oh boy, we're going to have new hotels and new casinos and new this and new that, and everybody's excited, but nobody's talking about the increased pollution levels, the, the challenges to the waterways, the, the already sensitive aquifer. Right now, the Chico Aquifer in southwest Louisiana, we know has ethylene dichloride in the upper sands as a result of the spill some years ago at Conoco where EDC made its way down to the upper sands of the aquifer and we're not sure exactly how deep it has gotten and eventually will tap the 527 foot level which is the drinking water level for the city of Lake Charles in southwest Louisiana and now we're talking about an 80 billion dollar industrial expansion seven of the plants being liquefied nitrogen gas plants. Well that's all wonderful there's a need for natural gas throughout the world. There's a huge demand, and that demand is going to increase. And so, um, but there's a price. There's a price that's going to be paid. And I just hope that that all are prepared, and we'll look into the challenges that we're about to face as a result of our hunger to satisfy our gluttonous appetite for energy. So I think that forums like this are very, very important as we have an opportunity to look at both sides of the equation, the value and the consequences. And I think that as students in law, which I'm sure there are those in this room that some of you have become going to come very wealthy as a result of the increased number of coal-fired power plants and coal production and coal exports and $80 billion expansions, you're going to have a lot of work to do. But it may be at the cost of my grandchildren and my descendants that are yet unborn. And we've got to give real consideration to that. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying shut down oil and gas industry. That's not going to realistically happen. But I just believe that we've got to be a whole lot smarter as to how we proceed. We've really got to use our heads as to how we proceed and not just think of the financial benefits, but also think about the back end implications and who might be impacted as a result. So that's my message. Um, we're drilling more, we're producing more. The Keystone Pipeline is a major issue. I testified in the U.S. Congress opposing the Keystone Pipeline. I took a helicopter tour across the tar sands of northern Canada and it literally made me sick. So this is what we've got to do to satisfy our appetite. That's got to be a better way. And so I just urge all of you, as you uh, continue in your careers toward uh, justice and meeting the needs of the American people, that you always give strong consideration to the impact. That's it. We have 20 minutes left, and now's the perfect time for Q&A. If we could, uh, Rome, you want to, yeah, y'all want to sit in the front, or? First question right here? Yeah, it's from Jerome. Um, Mr. Ringo, you, you mentioned uh, having funding to work on the hydro uh, work overseas. Um, I was shocked when the gentleman mentioned that the project in, uh, in, in Mississippi was being done by the Southern Company. And I've had a chance to meet with them. And uh, I, I had a meeting with the uh, Southern Company and with uh, Jim Rogers at Duke Energy. And I, I, I can appreciate that. Yeah, they're building coal fire power plants, but I'm seeing a real commitment by those companies to look at renewables and, and, and alternative measures. Now, not at the degree that I would hope, 
because you know, well, we're looking at alternative measures, but we're going to build more coal-fired power plants. So that uh, is sort of speaking with a forked tongue there. But um, I'm a bit concerned as to the expansion of coal in this country. I think we're headed in a, in, a, in a wrong direction, in the opposite direction, and that we're not spending enough money toward alternatives. Now, the question is, yes, I've met with Duke Energy and, uh, and, and Southern Company about our units, and yes, they are interested. But we decided to go to developing countries first where the need was the greatest. And that's why we're in Africa. Uh, the American companies have been a bit apprehensive about investing in Africa over the years, well, for a number of reasons, corruption, a whole lot of that. But because of the commitment of the Obama administration on the Power Africa pro project, $43 billion, it's really opened a way for us to get a lot of these projects finances through USAID and World Bank uh, that is uh, really eliminating the need for us to work directly with the governments of those countries. We really have the oversight of U.S. entities, and that, that helps a lot. Do you think that's going to get them, if, if it starts becoming successful overseas, it's going to get them interested and say, oh, you think? I can. <laughs> we tend to believe that uh, once the first unit's on the ground, and we're about to put the first unit in, we're signing the first PPA. Like next week, I'll be going back to Ghana. We believe that the world's going to come running because we have the only technology of its type in the world. We think the world's going to come running and say, "Hey, you know what? We can boost our energy output at our dams in the United States." without additional fuel, without dis displacing people, without additional power lines, and still satisfy the, yeah. uh, the, the, the appetite. Uh, can I add something? The, the company like the Southern Company, um, they're a traditional vertically integrated utility, right, where they, they own the plant where you make the power and the power lines and it goes to your meter. They get everything in between. The way they make their money <clears throat> is by investing capital. Right, so what you've got to do is make this technology more expensive. <laughs> so that, okay, I like can, that. I like that. <laughs> so that they can make, and if you do that, they are going to come running, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. then they can make you pay for it. But actually, it's you know, to get those guys to come along, you have to figure out a way to get them off of their traditional business yeah, model to yeah, some degree. Exactly, and that's a challenge. <laughs> that's a challenge. Yes, sir. I'm back. Uh, I'm just, just wondering, after Hurricane Isaac, we did some aerial reconnaissance of some facilities down River from the world, including those two coal terminals you showed, Ken and Morgan and right. United yeah, Bulk, and also the Alliance Refinery, um, another um, oil, gas, chemical infrastructure. And uh, the damage was pretty astounding from just a Category 1 hurricane. Mm. I'm wondering, uh, to what extent is the, the risk from damage from hurricanes taken into consideration by the companies or the state agencies that are permitting the, um, the expansion of, say, a full term of effect. Right. Well, in the applications, that storm preparation and what kind of armoring and protection you have, that is in those applications. Um, now, for any given one, whether that's adequate to actually protect you against a stochastic kind of event like a, a hurricane is a really good question. And, you know, you bring up a nice irony that, uh, you know, these fossil fuel terminals happen to be concentrated in coastal areas where they're most vulnerable to the impacts of <laughs> climate change, <laughs> sea level rise and all the things that comes along with that. But, yeah, it's there. But the problem is with, you know, tropical cyclones is, I mean, you know, nobody ever knows when something like a Hurricane Katrina is going to come yeah. along or what the specific impacts what of even a smaller storm is going to be in any given area because it's a very complex system. I would, I would so, add to that, particularly in the Alliance refinery case, it took over a year to get it back online. Mm. It was damaged more heavily than several others along the Gulf Coast here. We are sort of ground zero in terms of hurricanes but we also have 50% of the U.S. refining capacity. And when you look at our refineries and their ability to come back yeah. versus Sandy and the Northeast, Northeast took a heavier hit than we did. Yeah, we did. Sam. Well, um, well this is, I don't know if y'all can answer this, but it's a question you sort of raised, and, it, and it's a question that I was asked the other day, and I can't answer, 
which is the justification for in, increased development of oil and gas in the United States has been for energy independence. And yet, we continue to develop to such an extent that now the oil industry says we have an oil glut and we need to, to get export. Now, the justification wasn't financial. The justification now for exporting is financial. So, to me, it's a conflict. I don't know how to answer it. I mean, we're either, because the question somebody asked me of is, if this is, in fact, in the interest of national security, correct, that we diversify, then why are we not holding on to our reserves so that we ensure we have greater reserves in the future? Isn't that mean that the real motive for development is economic, not national security? And so, I mean, that's a question I have, because that was the justification. It is the justification for opening up the Arctic. It is the justification for why they think they need to go into the Atlantic. And yet, it seems to me that what we're going to be doing is, is totally exhausting our reserves before we get to a point where we may really need it in 2030, 2050, 2070. But we're going to have no reserves anymore. So can somebody explain to me how those two are consistent, that we're going to export, but yet it's for national security? Okay, can I add, one, can I add one, one caveat to that before you answer? Because these are the guys that need to answer. But it's also the thing, taking it to the next level, is if we reach independence, as, we, as has been our target, would we do the right thing for the world and invest that money back into making the, meg, the mega leap into sustainable energy sources that every oil company is going to cash in on? I mean, that, that's sort of a, the caveat. But. Well, let me, let me just start with what I alluded to in my presentation. We are already importing heavy sour crude from the people who don't like us very much. Right. Most typically, the, the Venezuelan and the Saudis a little bit. Uh, and Mexico. We, whether we, we agree with it or not, we view North America really as the, the energy security sphere. So if we, for example, swap light sweet crude oil that Mexico needs for heavy sour crude that they have, we haven't really changed the North American picture, but we've solved a problem relative to imports from other countries. And that is a, a, a national security improvement. We have so a, we consider, so when we, so when the energy industry, or we're talking national security, which nobody ever talks about, it, we are including Canada and Mexico as part of the, quote, energy independence? I think that, that we are, on a regional basis. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I've we already have swapped all kinds of things with Canada. We're just saying it was <coughs> Tim, thank you for that communist perspective. On <laughs> <laughs> vital industry. <laughs> Seriously, I, you know, I don't want to beat around the bush about that. I, I mean, frankly, I think, you know, I, I have friends that work in the oil and gas business and all that, but I think the people that run the, run the companies to give energy security is a convenient talking point to have, but it's really about, you know, producing it when you make money off of it. You know, that's, that's just, that, there's no sense in being coy about that. I mean, that's the nature of, it's a business and a capitalist economy. They don't, you know, and as far as climate change and, you know, whatever impacts fracking does or doesn't have, as long as you can externalize those costs, that's what you're going to do. That's what businesses do. I mean, it's like expecting dogs not to bark at cats. Well, it's sort of like I said before, and uh, you know, I use a very simple analogy. It's you're going to make a lot more money as a dealer than a junkie. Uh, we were a junkie before. Now we're the dealer, and so we're going to make more money as a de as a dealer, and that's what we're doing. Uh, bottom line, I mean, we can call it, we can dress it up any kind of way we want. It's about money. That's how I see it. It's about money. That's right, Scott. As far as these export booms are concerned, um, it's my job to review a lot of permits for environmental advocacy for bill frustration and work. And you see these these booms. You mentioned that there's a you know coal export, you know, we export 18 million tons, and recently there have been permitted four other facilities besides for this, each of which could export that capacity. And all of these facilities are in wetlands or on the river. Um, it, it doesn't seem like 
you know, and we see the same thing with the the gas export, where we had Shell, Say Soul, Axial, and Shell removed its project entirely, and Say Soul and Axial are saying, well, we can't do it right now. Um, and all of these facilities have hundreds of acres of, of wetland impact. Um, do the, I mean, the regulations, as I understand it, if there's a, a common activity, economic activity, with large environmental impact provides for something, a, a programmatic uh, impact, environmental impact statement for some, you know, a common economic activity, could that environmental regulation, like, help the industry plan better so we don't get these, like, huge pr proposals that clear the land and damage mm -hmm. the land that end up being, you know, kind of flops? Well, I think, first of all, you mentioned the, the Sassol plant. Sassol is not building their second phase right now, but they are spending $8 billion on a big steam cracker for ethylene. That takes ethane, which is a byproduct of natural gas production, and turns it into the basic building block for plastics. Now, we don't make anything out of the plastics, but we do make the bulk plastics and ship them to population centers on the East Coast, to the West Coast. So that's all, and the $80 billion that Jerome was talking about, I think 80 is actually a little low. That may be just that's Lake there. Charles. But that's Lake Charles. But, that's Lake Charles. Uh, the, the Sabine Pass LNG facility, Chenier's building, the Semper facility. Oh, it'll be 150 the, easy. Yeah. There, there's a number of these LNG facilities in and around Lake Charles, and there's a reason why. It's because that's where the pipelines go, mm -hmm. and that's where the water is. So. They don't use water internally, but they have to have navigable water to move the, the LNG offshore. Yeah. Well, Scott, and yes, there <laughs> should be a more uh, maybe developed master plan, if you will, for we want the LNG to be here and we want the coal to be there and the refineries. We're not going to move the refineries. We, we haven't built a new refinery what, since that call went in 35 years ago, but we have expanded the ones we've got. And Refineries need navigable water is one of the, the key ingredients. And right here in Mississippi, we can get up to Baton Rouge with a ship. That's as far as you can go. And that's with a ship that only draws 40 feet of water. One of the pet peeves that many of the industry guys and the shipping guys have is they have for years put money into trust funds to dredge the river to 50 feet. But the government never quite gets around to appropriating the funds out of the trust fund. Uh, so Congress comes back and says, well, we need more of a trust fund. And you say, well, why don't you use the one you've already got? You know? But, but uh, the one thing that's sure is that if we don't dredge, we're not going to be competitive in terms of being able to ship anything, whether it's oil, gas, coal, or, or finished products. So, Scott, I'd say this is, uh, I think I touched on this a little bit in my talk. I think, you know, the theory is, right, that both at the federal level with the National Environmental Policy Act and at the state level, right, with the regulations and everything implementing the constitutional public trust doctrine, there's plenty of legal framework there to do that kind of overall planning and analysis. But as a practical matter, the way these things get done now is somebody that's got an idea, right, brings in a single project, and you look at that project just on, you know, an individual basis and what's immediately around it. And again, you're really frequently dealing with agencies that don't have the resources to go and do the analysis on a very complicated project that involves international economies and you know involves ways of evaluating external impacts and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's another aspect to it, which is, um, and if uh, you all had Professor Hout for any of your classes here, nobody. Well, if you went to school here you would have to go to Professor Houck's class and it would cost you $40,000 a semester to get this. So you know, listen up. <laughs> the, uh, the deal is with environmental laws, um, often they come into being with very strict, you know, very good terms. And then the, really the way that they work, the bureaucracy sort of starts the process of 
dumbing them down to a level that's more comfortable to deal with. You can see this happen with the Endangered Species Act. It happened with the Clean Water Act. You know, the Clean Water Act says that the goal in 72 said the goal is we're going to end discharges of pollutants into waters of the United States. And, you know, that that's not going to happen. Right. Hadn't happened. It's not going to happen. So those laws kind of get knocked down to a level mm -hmm. where, you know, the entity, the state government, the federal government entities are comfortable in dealing with them. I would add the perspective from industry is that too many of our environmental laws get passed in a crisis atmosphere. So, yeah. and sometimes we don't even bother with passing a law, we just change the change regulations the based on a executive privilege uh, or executive action. Uh, Osla, I think, is a good example of that. No, nobody doubts that it was an, a nasty spill out on the West Coast, but we ended up with a law that nobody talked to the engineers, nobody talked to the analysts. Mm -hmm. And so, as a result, you've had to con continually modify it, and those modifications take place in an agency. Like Bob's saying, the agency may be dumbing it down, but the agency's trying to put it into a workable form. Yeah. I guess I'd add one more layer to that, which is that, uh, you know, that this is all an aspect of the complete political dysfunction we've had, especially in terms of environmental statutes. Um, you know, basically for the last 25 years, because really they're, they're, the federal Congress has literally done nothing to update environmental laws with extremely limited exceptions, say in the fisheries arena. Since 1990, it was really about the last major overhaul, and you look at something like the Endangered Species Act, I mean, you're dealing with a 40-year-old law now that doesn't reflect the knowledge that you've gotten because, you know, People are scared to bring those things up for fear that the laws will be gutted. So you wind up, and a practical effect of that is to, you know, whether you like it, whether you like what the bureaucracy does or not, a practical effect of that is that you put power into the bureaucracy, which isn't elected. But we can't continue to be a uh, just reactive. Yeah. You know, we'll put a street light up when three people get killed on that corner. <laughs> that, that, that just simply makes no sense. And, and, and that was one of the things when I testified opposing the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, I guess we're going to have to have a major leak of a pipeline like Keystone in order to start changing regulations on, on uh, transportation of hazardous materials across the country. And, and it's just, just, just reactive attitude is really hurting us bad. On that point, would you rather have ten train accidents or one rail accident? Well, the because point... That's what you're going to get. Okay, and I, I respect that, but let me, and surely without the spirit of, of debating it, but uh, my point uh, was opposing Keystone was not necessarily the pipeline itself, but the route of which it was taken through the breadbasket of America, which had the potential, if that was any type of a catastrophic leak through the direction that it was going, could you know, paralyze America which we, with respect to the food source. The other thing that I was arguing on Keystone was that I was urging the developers of the Keystone Pipeline to tell the American people the truth. Because they were basically saying, well, we're going to create all these jobs and we're going to do all these steel projects, when the truth was, was that 90% of the steel on the Keystone Pipeline was not American steel that was being imported from China. And the majority of the of the the jobs that they were talking about were mainly going to be short-term jobs because once you get a, build a pipeline, how many personnel you need to run a pipeline? And so I was urging the developers of the pipeline to simply just be honest with the American people, and 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 make sure that all necessary steps are taken to make the operation as safe as possible. We got millions of, pi of miles of pipeline already in this country, so I'm not saying. We don't need it, or there's no need, or, it's, or it's, it's not as safe as trucking. But let's make sure that we take the necessary steps to make it as safe as possible and reduce the impact as best as possible. That was my point, and you can see that testimony on well, and I, YouTube I and C SPAN. I would disagree with yeah. you. I yeah. think the, the point I'm trying to make is that when people are given two negatives to choose from, sure. they don't choose one, they typically go out the back door, yeah, yeah, leaving the field. Yeah. Yeah. What we have with Keystone is the ability to displace imported heavy sour crude 
and to continue to run the refinery capacity that we've spent zillions of dollars to do. Well, I'd love to take those zillions of dollars and invest them in renewable energy technology. Well, I, I think you'll get some of that along the way. Okay, and that will be an alternative to building pipelines and increasing uh, 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 fossil fuel use in this country. And with that, it's a perfect ending to the session. Thank you.